So yes, I think it's time to start. So hello everyone, uh, I'm Mohit Shainbi and today uh, is the first event in the 2022 digital event series of the ISTBS. Today's students research seminar is led by Mr. David Jelinek, a student researcher at Mississippi State University. I'd like to invite his advisor, Dr. George Mason to introduce David before he tells us about his work. Okay. My name is uh, George Mason. <clears throat> I'm a professor at Mississippi State University, CAVS. David is a freshman coming on board working with CAVS. He's working with a, a, a good amount of data and has had to use some programming to uh, put it together. It's related to mobility and a mobility database that we're assembling and, and trying to create from a relational standpoint. David's work is instrumental in there and and he will walk through his steps in putting the database together from an old archival text files and, and the challenges that have been posted for him. So uh, David with that I'll, I'll let you go forward with your talk. Um, let's see. I th all right. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming. And yeah, I'm David Jelinek. I'm a freshman here as, at the Mississippi State University. And as Dr. Mason introduced, um, I work at the Center for Advanced Vehicular Systems. I'm a student worker and I work underneath Dr. Mason. Um, I am well, the university is working on a large relational database, and it, the goal of that database is to improve accessibility of test data for off-road vehicle performance research. Um, this database has approximately 10,000 public release records currently from more than 100 reports, and those originate from 1947 to the present. Uh, they've been put together by the Defense Technical Information Center, Center and that's delayed their public release somewhat. And um, these reports contain tabulated fine-grained soil and coarse-grained soil wheel and track testing data from lab and field tests, which measure drawbar pull, motion resistance, sinkage, slip, and other wheel performance variables. So this presentation is providing an overview of the project and its goal is to get some input about the challenges that we're facing of digitizing this data. So an important test that gathers a lot of the measurements that I'll be talking about is the drawbar pull test. Uh, drawbar pull is the pulling force of a moving vehicle um, parallel to the surface it's moving along. and um, to conduct this test, uh, there's a powered or unpowered wheel or track held by a carriage and that carriage is under vertical load and the wheel rolls along bins of soil. And so as the wheel is rolling, well, and also before, of course, um, the soil strength, the wheel radius, the vertical load, sinkage, carriage speed, and all those variables are measured. Um, I'm gonna define some of these variables now, so the first variable is wheel slip, which describes the speed of a wheel's rotation in terms of the entire vehicle's forward speed. Um, when you have positive slip, your the velocity of your wheel is faster than the velocity of your vehicle, and um, it can happen when you're accelerating very quickly. So I have the formula here. Um, you subtract the velocity of the carriage from the velocity of the wheel and the, the slip is in terms of, it's a percentage of the velocity of the wheel. Um, and you can also have negative wheel slip when the velocity of the carriage is greater than that of the wheel. Um, the problem is that can approach um, infinity and you need a more useful indicator called skid where the velocity of the wheel is subtracted from the velocity of the carriage and that's a percentage of the velocity of the carriage. Um, 
The next variable is the cone index, which describes soil strength. Its definition is the average force per unit area required to push a cone-shaped probe. That probe is called a cone petrometer, and you push that into soil at a steady rate. Um, these two graphs show um, cone penetration resistance curves for two different soils. Uh, one of the soil is more loose than the other, and as such, it has less penetration resistance as you go deeper into the soil. Um, to find the cone index value, you'd get the average cone penetration resistance value from each of these curves. Um, now, with all of these variables, they they're correlated to each other, and the database has to preserve that correlation. just with labeling. Um, the last two variables I'm discussing are gross traction and net traction, which describe the force of a wheel on a wheel moving along a surface. Um, so since the contact between a wheel and surface deforms both, there's a resistive force to the wheel's rotation. Um, gross traction acts in favor of rotating the wheel. It's the friction force between the wheel and surface that's acting parallel to the surface. Um, it's equal to the wheel's torque divided by its radius. And net traction is the force of the wheel's motion, forward motion, after the res these resistive forces against rotation act against it, um, as in the graphic. So now that I've gone through the background, I'll go through the digitization process, which I'm involved in. Um, so the reason this process, this data needs to be digitized is um, it's the digital versions of it have been lost over time, and that's requiring the paper records to be rescanned and interpreted into text files again into a new digital database. So the scans are stored in online libraries and local databases, and from there we can um, digitize the files into text, put them into Excel, and graph them, and have the text as a reference as the database. Um, so the process of converting um, images of text into text is done with OCR or optical character recognition technology. Um, OCR programs, they read images of text to recognize common characters and the formatting. Um, the problem with this old text is it uh, these uh, freely available OCR programs haven't been trained to it, so they can't really recognize it. Uh, that requires me to do some pre-processing to make the text more like normal text. Um, here's an example of what I'm working with. It's around 75 dots per inch. And yeah, the, so I have to make work with that. So my my process is I'm programming in Python and I'm using an image editing module called OpenCV and an OCR module from a Google program called Tesseract and the Python app adaptation is PyTesseract. So here I have an original measurement from a PDF scan um, I grayscale it and I blur it to connect the dots. I threshold it to have sharp characters again, and I invert it so it's in normal coloration. Um, this process isn't perfect. Um, I especially have to adjust it for different scans because they have different darkness of text and maybe some are more blurry. It's, they're harder to recognize. And after, after it hopefully works, um, it's it has to be preserved in text files. Um, here is an Excel file of um, uh, where I imported a .csv and and I recreated the data table. Um, all of these labels ha should be preserved in in the database that we're making inside text files as um, attributes. And that way it can be standardized and we can even potentially search for data across multiple programs automatically with a program. And 
one challenge we're facing is what labels should we use for attributes? Um, we need to follow some sort of standards, either ISTVS or other professional standards. Some of the labels we're using right now, for example, are DB for drawbar pull or DBMA for drawbar pull that's corrected for inertia of an accelerating wheel or vehicle. And moving on, um, once we can, once we have access to the data, it's digitized. We have a lot of, we have a variety of applications for it, including comparing it to numerical models. Um, displayed here is the gross traction equation, where there's a logistical relationship between slip and uh, normalized gross traction. Okay. Another application is in vehicle terrain interface and NATO reference mobility models. Those can also be compared to the data that we have. And those, as, we, as everyone, as background, um, these are a series of equations for um, wheel performance parameters that I've listed before, drop bar pull, traction, sinkage, and slip. Um, and you can compare predictions to measured values. Um, another application is in discrete element method where um, wheel terrain interaction is simulated at a um, high resolution and simulation parameters for, for this <laughs> this work can be uh, calibrated based on comparing, again, comparing predictions to test results. Um, here are graphs that result from discrete element method simulations um, of normal and shear stress along a wheel. Um, and one more application of this database would be for training neural networks. Um, Neural networks with training can optimize mobility parameters for vehicles, such as tire pressure, center of mass, and so on. And this database has some relevant quantities to that. Um, for more information for access to the database, you would have to contact um, Mr. Jody Pretty. Um, his contact is here. And if you would like to learn more about the Drove data set. Here are two papers published by Mississippi, Mississippi State University. Um, there's also a paper that I referred to about DEM um, and VTI, and I have been referring to the ISTVS definitions for the quantities I've gone go over. Um, so in summary, um, uh, the points of discussion that we would be that I would be interested after this presentation would be um, finding ways to improve the digitization process for these low resolution text images um, about designing uh, this database so that it connects soil and wheel performance data with standardized labels and um, organization that accounts for temporal distribution as well as varying or uniform slip, um, as well as input about potentially developing a data mining program or and potential applications for this project. Uh, thank you for listening. And Please let me know if you have any questions or comments. Thank you, David. That, that was um, David gave us a, a real rough look at what we've been working on now for three or four years. The, the data sets are pretty extensive, and the rebuild those laboratories would be incredibly expensive. But uh, the data he has could hopefully augment. Um,
current laboratory testing that's been conducted at other facilities. Um, so we're entertaining any questions right now. Uh, yeah. Thank you, David and Dr. Mason. Uh, we would like to invite our viewers to join the conversation by clicking on share audio and video to ask your questions live. In the meanwhile, uh, in the questions tab, we do have some questions. Firstly, who do you think will be the main users of the database? That's um, right now it's being used to verify, validate NRMM and potentially NRMM NG as, as it begins to stand up and, and uh, make some headway. But we've been able to go back and, and revisit the soul tire interaction algorithms that have been historically used by NRMM in the procurement process by the Army and, and uh, publish the results there, showing the uncertainty or, or variabil uh, variance in the predicted and measured. Thank you. Also, um, there are two questions by Ms. Dixon. So firstly, um, what tools have you found that work best for OCR of the printed data? And it would have been difficult to get the columns handled properly in the scans. Um, something that's very helpful is grouping um, the, the scans into just the text that you're interested in and widening out any um, unusual formatting. Um, so I'll, I could I have a large data table that I'm looking at and it, so the columns are irregularly placed and I have to annually wipe them out for now. And I also am cropping the entire scan into just the grid of the data table. So cropping is very helpful. And the internet, I've been just finding um, uh, filtering processes from the internet on Python. Thank you. And when you say preserved in text files, do you mean a .csv or some other format that is compatible with the software you use? Uh, further, how much do seasonal or climate changes affect the data obtained from field test? Does the database take this into consideration since some of the data is from the 1940s? Um, the main measures for accounting for that is with the main noticing in the tables talking. And you have the Uh, thank you, David. Uh, I think your voice is going off a bit due to internet issues or something. Can you repeat the question? It, it had to do with the relevance of the data because of its age? Uh, no. So basically, uh, as the data, uh, like as the seasons of climate changes have occurred over the years, uh, does the database take this into consideration since like some of the data that is found like that is a part of the databases from the 1940s like from old times yes uh, so, so so there was two different soil types measured primarily so a, a clay and a sand and a track and a wheel on each of those and David's working right now the wheel on the clay We've worked the others, and they varied the clay with moisture content to try to get the seasonal variations expected in the field. And of course, uh, one of the issues we're running into is how to connect the soils data to the performance data of the wheel, and and so he's he's working that issue. Um, but but those are two interrelated databases that what your answer it, it gives you the variance with seasonality um yes and and so the test data will run up to speeds of 40 miles an hour um and, and mostly at slow speeds sometimes they varied load sometimes they varied slip sometimes they maintained it constant so a, a big mix of, of 
different types of tests and, and performance data. Thank you. Uh, we have Dr. Keen with us. So Dr. Keen, could you please ask a question live? Yeah, hello, David. Hello, George. Um, a couple of questions, really. The first one I, I've written up on the, the Q&A, and uh, quite interesting. You, you, I think you said you had about 10,000 uh, data entries so far. Uh, what sort of source of data is it? Because um, presumably in your part of the world, you must be using a lot of data from WES. Um, and uh, I, I, if I'm trying to think back. If, if you think about people like Brixius, they used a whole range of data from a whole load of applications. Some of it was um, probably military, some of it's agricultural, some of it's probably forestry, I'm not quite sure. But I know that um, I think they use some, some UK data in, 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 in some of that. So are you focusing on any particular line, for example, data, which is gonna be useful for military purposes? Or is it really anything that you think looks uh, a, a good enough standard or quality to be able to use? That was the, the first part of that question. Uh, and I think somebody may be starting to ask a little bit, is this sort of, uh, are you focusing on newish data or are you looking at anything going back to, um, you know, even sort of to several decades ago? Uh, and the, the, the third part of that is as, We've moved from 70s, 80s, 90s. Tire design has changed a bit. Have you got an ability to see, of any, uh, identify any of the effects of the change of tire design over time? Is that something that, that might be? Now, I'll come back to the second question afterwards if, you, if you've got any thoughts on those, uh, those three points. I'm trying to field some of it, David. Uh, the, the... And you you help me because this is supposed to be your talk. But uh, so the, the, source, source of data was the first part. Uh, still in this. Okay. Is it published papers? Uh, Where's um, uh, have you got any any particular sources that we probably may not even know about? I don't know if it's, if it's all out there or is it? Have you got access to uh, to um, uh, you know things so, that? So it's it is everything we could find on DTEC that had data, uh, including Auburn. We went to Auburn Labs and picked up some data from them. There, so Auburn is that? Um, uh, oh gosh, is that um, that's down in in the south, isn't it? Is that further yes. south than than than, than uh, uh, Vicksburg, or is it in that sort of Auburn? facilities uh were where Brixis and I think Brixis came out of there uh Raphael and Bert they but the um soil tillage labs which were right. funded uh under that program were built and and they're in Alabama not far from us about a okay, uh, hundred right. miles so away similar sort of soil or different uh uh, it is a, a, a red clay soil that they were working with, so there's a different soil type there. Uh, some of the sands that we tested in Erdic were shipped all the way from Yuma, so they were loaded on a train and shipped here from Yuma, Arizona. Right. So the soils came from everywhere that were tested at Erdic, and we tried to go beyond that and find anything that Defense Technical Information Center had posted and pull those tables, digitize them, and try to group them right. together. So somewhere like Yuma, I, I suspect that sounds as though, um, thinking back to my sort of watching of Westerns in my youth, that was a probably not a particularly agricultural type of sand. Is that right? It would be more of a, um, you know, of more interest for military work than agriculture, or is, 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 have I got that sort of wrong? You're right. Uh, we've gotten kickbacks on journal articles that were published with SANS because they didn't think anything would be planted in the sand, <laughs> likely so. So, so why look at it? Uh, and it, it tends to have uh, a little bit on military applications, a lot on military, and, and then some on recreational studies. So uh, anytime there's a beach uh, 
uh, uh, excursion or, or folks uh, going on the pure sand that, that becomes an issue. Um, yeah, and then you get uh, different types of sands and things of that nature. So it becomes a whole. But but we we've tried to reach out and get as much data as publicly available, and and even some of it's not, but most of it's uh, publicly available data. Our, our um, what Dave is doing is kind of interesting. He's this this is a kind of a data mining exercise, and as we created the database, we physically began to put it together as one big file that had similar attributes of pool motion resistance and other things of that nature. The problem with that is you create this one file, somebody may come in and say it's proprietary or there's there's uh, some restrictions on the release. If you write a program like Davis doing it, it just, it just reaches out there and reads all this data and creates the data file on demand, you you move around the proprietary issues. If it's the reports are out there and it can find those reports, read the data and create the database, it, it's uh, really a, a nice end run. And, and the, so if, if you're looking back at the papers, for example, like Robert Wismer and Luth, would they have used data from somewhere like uh, WES or would they have concentrated on um, you referred back to Auburn. They would have uh, done a little bit of both. Uh, Wismer came from Erdic and was in the laboratories with Freetag. He created some of his initial equations under Nuttall. Then he moved as a lead engineer to John Deere and they had their own soil testing lab downstairs. And some of that data we may never be able to find, but a lot of the initial data he used to create his algorithms came out of Verdict. So we're hoping that, and, and we use this data set to go back and revisit his equations to see how accurate they were. Right. So uh, would he, if he was working for Deer, would he be using um, test sort of facilities much in the, in the, in the states further north? North. Uh, yes, he would be up in Iowa right now, probably. Right, yeah. in a, basement working with the lab there. Yeah, just trying to think, is uh, John Deere based, is it Des Moines? Des Des Moines? Des Moines? Des Moines, yes. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm saying Des it very well. Des Moines. Des Moines, Des Moines, that's right, yes. It's sort of probably uh, left over from, from when it was French uh, two or three centuries ago. But uh, um, so are you looking at the same data again uh, or are you sort of just as i say are you more interested um from what you're saying um from what what david was sort of talking about are you more interested in military applications rather than uh, the sort of applications of of, of uh, the likes of john deere and, and others uh, right now we're kind of open uh, to both commercial and military working within the university. Uh, Mississippi State's a land grant uh, university. Uh, the first president, Stephen, General Stevens, was the um, youngest general in the Confederate Army. And he turned around and, and um, created Mississippi State to work with ag community. So, so it's a, uh, the university itself is a, as an agricultural uh, research institute. So. But uh, CAVS reaches out and does military and and uh, and ag commercial. So we're, we're trying to we're trying to push this thing to a public releasable database that can be used as maybe a topic of study in, in different courses. Yeah, I mean, are you so, um, does that cover a wide enough time span to to look at the the effect of time and design of of, of tires, or is that still early days to where you? You we are, have radio we're hoping to be. We have radio and bias ply tires in there. A good minute, good bit of the data that David's working with right now is is bias ply, which is a little bit dated. Um, ideally, some of the algorithms should work the same, but upgrading it to a to a, a bias ply would, I mean, a, a radio tire would be really good, and some of the newer tire types. 
uh, the databases will be set to be, uh, you know, added to over the years. So as uh, new laboratories are stood up, hopefully we can use this database and augment it with their data. Right. The, the, the second uh, sort of question was a little bit uh, touched on, I think, a little bit in, in, in the talk, and that was, or in one of the answers, um, answers to one of the questions, uh, and that is, uh, I remember when I was looking at paddy field clay, then uh, collecting a lot of the data had been collected at the Asian Institute of Technology uh, from all the various reports. Uh, and then looking at coin, coin, cone index versus moisture content, this is moisture contents up to about, you know, 40, 50%, really soft, wet, uh, gooey uh, um, uh, uh, material. Uh, there was quite a good correlation as the moisture goes up and the, the cone index obviously uh, goes down. But that was one, essentially, it's one test area and one soil type. So you you probably expect there to be, and that the soil being used in a similar way year after year, you probably expect some sort of uh, correlation. Um, I Are you able to do any of that or to try and to cross-correlate soil properties at all? From the data that you're you're getting, I mean, it, it might be cone uh, uh, index against moisture content for different soils. It might be some other uh, property that you're 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 particularly interested. Is that something that you're hoping to do, or have you already been able to to start looking at? There's a different database called OLS Opportune Landing Zone. Susan out of uh, Crail is now beginning to revisit it with the University of Wisconsin, I believe. Um, but we put that data set together. It is probably more in line with what you're talking about, soil moisture, soil strength. One problem you pointed out is if you walk away from the site you're at, that relationship between moisture and strength is different. And so as you begin to globally look at these relationships, they start to get real scattered but if you can get, get a localized soil you can probably get a good correlation and these reasons for variances between geographical areas maybe due to overburden pressure or other you know glacial deposits for over the years up in montana versus the fluvial plains down in the south uh, whether the clays are created through a sedimentary process you know it all these things seem to give you an indication of why the correlations are better in certain regions than others. So the OLS, OLS, excuse me, the OLS database, Opportune Landing Zone had, they went out to regions all over the world and collected soil moisture and soil mm -hmm. strength and had the, the uh, spatial variability built into it. It, it may be that uh, a study at that level is needed to get a really good correlation. Yeah. I mean, obviously, if, I'm sort of probably thinking a little bit, if, if you've collected data at one moisture content, but you know that the um, the application is going to be another, it, could, it it starts to give you some tools to try and see what the what the changes may well be when you actually come to apply the data to a, to a new uh, soil characteristic or change of characteristic. Yes. But if you, if you apply your soil moisture, soil strength, a relationship to the fluvial plain in Mississippi, it'll probably fall apart because the structure of the clay is different and the chemistry. It may be your Martin Merrill night. I'm a, I'm a kaolinite. Uh, there, there's other factors. And so it's, it's yeah. tease out these factors. There's probably, and, and this database is, the answer to your initial question, this database is not set up to do that type study, but there are some databases that, could be created through a data mining process that might support that question. Okay, is, is that the type of thing that you would hope to be able to incorporate in the future or is this still very early days? Oh, sure, sure. In the future, that would be a, a great uh, application or approach. Because what Dave is doing right now is being able to read the data and process it. He still has some so, so ISDVS has standards, uh, but they don't tell you like, what is the um, attribute for gross traction? What is a, a uh, 
a variable name for gross traction that would be uh, consistent across all databases. And so in David's case, when he reads a technical report, maybe one you publish and you have a table in there and it's out on the internet, he's able to get that table and process the data. The label you use for gross traction may be completely different from the label I used and, and that makes his data mining a little bit more difficult. So, right. I suppose that, that's almost a follow up, isn't it? How do you um, correct for different uh, um, methodologies in collecting data? I mean, uh, is it if you've got, for example, uh, if you've got sort of lots of, of, of uh, soil tanks or test strips which are reused and remolded, and then you're trying to compare that to uh, um, structured soil, for example. Um, do you need corrections for that? Have you got any comparisons of the same test in different situations? Uh, how much variation are you likely to get in in the performance of of of, of, the, of the, the you know the characteristics you're looking at the the drawbar pulls and the, the slips and so on? Yes, yes. Macros that, that, that uh, could play. be quite quite a tricky quite a tricky job. Yeah. So hopefully he'll be creating an XML file, extended markup file that's it's, it's it's generated from these data tables that you and I create in some of our technical reports. And and we as we run into those questions, we'll try to get a consensus from the community as we move forward. Okay, I think you uh, looks looking at the question. You've got one from Andrews, so I'll I'll hand over to uh, Andrews. Is that the next one, uh, Moet? I'm not sure. Looking at the uh, yeah, but Andrews uh, has some internet issues, I think, at his place, so I don't think he'll be joining in. So I'll just read out the question. So can you expand a bit about how the database can be used in ML applications? Like, will you measure your own data and then use the database to make decisions on go, no go, et cetera? OK, I'll move out the way. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Key. So that's a question. How say say it again? I didn't. Uh, so basically, after the creation of the database, uh, can you expand a bit about how it would be used in machine learning applications? Like, for example, once the database is cre created, would you like to measure your own data and try to validate it against the, like, basically validate it against the data from the database to make decisions on go, no go, etc. Mobility uh, decisions. Yeah, and, and David, you pipe in if you've got an answer for these questions. But I want to say the answer to that is yes. Um, but things like the central tire inflation system, we don't know what the optimum tire pressure is for a lot of these vehicles. And this would uh, establish a training data set to allow the, the, uh, um, the inputs from the vehicle say uh, torque to the torque tire pressure slip and an iterative effort to come up with an optimum tire pressure. That might be one application of the data set as a training data set for a CTI for a given vehicle. And if it changes tires, you have a new training set. Um, it, you can use a, a what's called a, a state filter approach or a common filter to, to um, adapt to the new tire that's on there and and re-optimize, if you will, that tire pressure. So there are some ways to not only use this as a training data set, but also to use whatever new data is coming in to readjust the algorithm. Um, David, do you want to say something? I'm still... Well, that, does, that, does that answer his question? We can't hear you, David. Learning. There you go. Okay. I'm 
I'm still Roasters. your audio is still breaking up, David. Is it yeah. like an yeah. issue with the headphone or something? Well, I don't feel too bad. I still, I haven't had it. <laughs> but uh, you're breaking up on us, David. Okay. See if you can cut off your audio uh, video, and that'll help. See if you can cut your video off. Talk to us now. No, it looks like he's having some internet problems too. Yeah. Uh, Any other questions? Uh, actually, I had one question. Uh, so I'm not very much familiar with the kind of data that TTIC has, like accumulated like from the places in the world so beyond it so i'm assuming dtic data is primarily related to us or nato but beyond that are there any open source data from other like places that you would like to incorporate as a part of your database yes one of the reasons for doing these uh, is, is to solicit information that we can bring in and, and uh, digitize and add to the database. Um, and because I know there's more laboratories out there than what, we, what we've hit on already. Uh, and so, so we'll be glad to, to pull the other data sets in. I think the University of Iowa grabbed hold of the soil testing bins from Caterpillar, maybe. And so they they should have some data. Karina has a data set out there that we hadn't touched. Um, Becker actually did a tremendous amount, and, and I don't know where that data resides anymore. But um, we, we've gotten most all the data we can from the labs at Erdick and, and Auburn. Um, and it seems like we have a couple other areas. And, and we're looking for both field and laboratory testing from any part of the world. I suspect to go that route, though, we're going to have to release this database. So I'm working on a public release version of the data so that it can be open source. DTAC is the Defense Technology Information mm -hmm. Center. It's considered the oldest digital library in, in, in the world. It is, however, a U.S. Uh, DOD funded site. So it, it does, uh, but there is an open source area area in there. You can get access to public information there, but there is uh, some deep dive areas where you can go in and get more uh, proprietary data, which, uh, well, that's the struggle we're running into right now is making sure that all the TRs that went into the database are, are not proprietary so, so that we uh, can release it. So we hope to have a, a have that portion completed in the next ninety days. We're, we're hope working towards that. If that works out, we'll use the database to teach courses in statistics related to off road mobility and traction, and and uh, build on the database from there. Thank you. So yes, uh, if we do not have any more questions, we'll move towards the closing. Firstly, thank you, David, and thank you, Dr. Mason, for <clears throat> for the talk as well as um, like answering our questions and giving us more insights into the work that you have been doing. Uh, yep. So before we close, uh, I would just like to say. A few things. Firstly, the ISTBS is developing an open source wiki kind of website called the ISTBS Resource Initiative, for which we are in inviting graduate students to participate and create uh, a more technical and informed uh, website for new researchers as well as established researchers to be up to date with the kind of things that are happening uh, as a part of the different subject domains under the uh, like off-road mobility. Uh, beyond that, currently the ISTBS is also uh, undergoing a membership drive and we invite all the all our listeners as well as uh, anyone who's more who wants to get more involved in the society as well as want to know more about ISTBS. 
to join uh, the ISTVS using either of the links here. So that's it from my side for today. Uh, have a good day, good afternoon, good evening, whichever part of the world you are in. And uh, we will be expecting to see all of you again next week when Dr. George Mason presents a Terra Mechanics bike. Thank you. Thank you.